Alrighty, welcome, good morning everyone. I'm so glad you were able to make it. I know I wouldn't have been. This is a little too early for me, but nonetheless, we're gonna get really deep into some technicals. That's the best way to start the day. Hello, Sonny. Um, so, Casper, Plasma, and Sharding, these are like the three pillars of Ethereum in 2018. Um, I talk a lot about Casper, or at least I did last year, and so I'm going to assume everyone knows Casper like the back of their hand. But we're going to get into minimum viable plasma. So ho hopefully, I, I, I this I've given this part, this section of the talk a number of times, but I think it's I think it's good. And this time I'm going to I'm refining it. So this is this is going to be the best minimum viable plasma overview. So. Number one, minimum viable plasma, it's about scalability, right? We're trying to scale the blockchain, but it's not scalability at all costs. It's scalability while maintaining decentralization. So we want to make sure that the security of the plasma chain, it is as secure as the root chain, essentially. And if you have a plasma chain that is not as secure as the root chain, then it's not really a plasma chain. Um, and this is, these are the kinds of guarantees that we want to make, make sure. Uh, you know, tokens cannot be double spent, and so the pl Plasma MVP, I should say, is is a token transfer uh, a blockchain. So it's you know based UTXO, super simple stuff, um, and it has the normal uh, uh, security guarantees of a token transfer blockchain. Let me actually start my timer so I know how long we're going. Okay, so tokens can always be redeemed on the main chain. This is the key to the security property that Plasma provides. If the, the Plasma chain goes bad, then you can always pull your, your coins off and bring them onto the main chain. So, Plasma exits. This is actually how you pull the, the, the coins off of the main chain. Um, and off of the plasma chain. And it basically, it's the, it's the key mechanism which secures Plasma. Um, and the, the MVP is designed for just simple token transfers, you know, just, just transacting these, any ERC-20 token or Ether. Um, but it can also be designed for, you know, ERC-721, general state transitions, et cetera. So, so this is actually an active area of research, and there are many active area of areas of research that are going on in parallel. And so the cool thing about Plasma is it's not a, like, protocol given to the, the people. It's essentially a design pattern that has been, you know, starting to be explored, and anyone can contribute their own, you know, make their own Plasma implementation. But if you do make your own Plasma implementation, make sure that the security is actually secure, you know, make sure that it actually does require the root chain to be compromised for your plasma chain to be compromised. If you have your plasma chain, if it is less secure than the root chain, or significantly less secure than the root chain, then it doesn't really follow the kind of guiding principles of plasma. We are implementing plasma, and we have a call once every two weeks, and it's super exciting, so please check out the YouTube channel. Boom. So. Here is an overview of MVP. We've got on the left, we've got the miners. On, in the middle, we've got the plasma operator. And on, wait, yes, on the right, we have the, the, the plasma chain. So the plasma chain is actually, the, the, plasma, ch the contract, plasma contract is deployed on the main chain. And that manages the, the uh, uh, it essentially secures the plasma blocks. And those blocks actually exist on in the, the plasma operator's uh, uh, like database. So we're going to go over a few kind of normal functions of a plasma chain. Basically, the operator is going to create a block. A new user is going to come in and start transacting. Then we're going to have the new user try to steal some coins, basically double spend in, in some, some, some ways. And we're going to destroy that. You know, we're, we're going to f uh, 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 make sure that doesn't happen. And the operator is also going to create an invalid block, and the users are going to exit. So even so, this is what I was saying about the root chain security. We want to make sure that the plasma chain is as secure or close to as secure as the root chain, and that is why we can actually have a single plasma operator, because it is a constrained authority. This is a proof of authority network at first. However, it is a constrained authority. So. The plasma operator is going to create a plasma block. This plasma block is contained in the plasma operator's, you know, fancy database, and it's going to send a transaction which contains the, you know, Merkle root of the transactions and the state to the main chain. And the miner is going to receive it and mine a block. And so that basically goes. It makes the the plasma chain block go from from like light gray where it's not confirmed to confirmed 
once it's been included in the Ethereum main chain. So Sam is going to come over, and we're going to have Sam do some transactions. So Sam's going to deposit some ETH. That immediately creates a block on the main chain. That block is going to say, OK, Sam now has this balance, and it automatically confirms because it, there's, no, there's no real cost. Like if you were to think about what's actually happening, you're, you're sending a transaction on the main Ethereum network, and the main Ethereum network is just immediately adding, a adding like some data to the Plasma contract. So now the, the Plasma operator is like forced to update their state to, to sync with the main chain. So the, uh, Sam is going to now start watching the main chain for misbehavior. And Alice will come in and do the same. So Sam is going to send a bunch of tokens to Alice. So sends 2,500 PETH. That just because you know we, we now have 1,000 transactions per second. Oh, great, We're, we can scale. Um, and it'll create a block with all of those transactions. And note that the block has not been confirmed. The block will then go be submitted into the main chain. And the miner will mine the block. Now, you will notice that the, the balances have not yet been updated. This is because there is a confirmation mechanism. We're actually going to get into potential ways to remove the confirmation mechanism later on. However, uh, this is in the Plasma MVP spec. You still have it. So the Sam is going to notice the, the two chains, the Plasma chain and the root chain, see that the transaction was included, and then sign a message and send it to Alice saying, OK, I actually do acknowledge the fact that my transaction was in the main chain. And at that moment, Sam, uh, 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 Alice can actually spend those coins. Great. So Sam is now going to try to exit with coins that Sam no longer has because Sam sent them to Alice. So Sam submits an exit transaction onto the main chain. So remember, the, the main chain is really you know, the final arbiter of all the, the different things. And that's what keeps the plasma operator in line. That's what keeps each user in line. Now, the exit transaction is going to come in, but the, the exit will have this challenge period. And the challenge period says, OK, if your exit is invalid, then you know, I will, I, I, I'm accepting any transaction from anyone to challenge this. And anyone who challenges it successfully is going to receive a security deposit bond. So Alice will notice that this exit has been included in the main chain and immediately say, OK, I'm going to try to challenge this, this exit. And in fact, anyone can notice that an invalid exit has occurred and challenge it. And so the incentive is, OK, I'm going to submit an exit. It's going to come with a, bo a, a bond for or basically a bounty for anyone who challenges me. And that will pay for the, 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 the person's time to, to, to challenge. So this is a really nice thing. Basically, it's like, it's like if, if you were trying to steal something, and as you stole things, you, you gave a bounty for you know, catching you. It's really a nice, nice incentive. So sends the challenge period, I mean, sends the challenge before the challenge period ends. and with the, basically the Merkle proof of the, the transaction uh, uh, tree and the, the state tree. And the contract evaluates that, checks to see that it's invalid, and pays Alice's security deposit. So it cancels, cancels Sam's exit. Great. So super exciting. Attack failed. One out of two. Now, the next one, operator is going to create an invalid block. This is a little bit scarier. Um, because the operator is able to create new blocks, that allows an operator to essentially create a block which prints a bunch of money for itself. Now, the issue here is the plasma operator now has 999 PETH. PETH is, by the way, just the plasma ETH. Um, Sam has 2.5, Alice is 3.5. This is a little bit scary because the co smart contract itself doesn't have 999 ETH. So the, the, the plasma operator is going to send a transaction to the root chain. The root chain is going to then mine it, and we're in trouble. We're in trouble. The, the root chain now thinks that plasma operator can, has this, this amount of ETH. So the clients notice this bad behavior, and they say, OK, I actually don't want to. I'm not going to be in this chain anymore. I'm going to exit before my money gets stolen. So the exit comes in, and the plasma operator submits an exit as well. So this is scary, because the plasma operator, if they were to be able to exit, would be able to steal you know, all, basically all of the, the PETH, all the ETH that is now locked up in the Ethereum smart contract. So exits are mined. And the interesting thing is they are based, they are processed based on transaction ordering. So the, the idea is when you send a transaction, it's going to be included in one of these blocks, and we're going to say, okay, the last person who sent a transaction for this coin is going to be the one who gets the 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 um, the, the the their coins back, unless there's a challenge. So the exits 
for the plasma operator are going to be in a later block than the exits for uh, uh, Sam and Alice, but we'll, we'll see how that works. So, so on the sides, you have the ones, right? So we're going to go up through all of the blocks and see, you know, when do we uh, return funds? So block one, no funds return. Block two, no funds return. Block three. And then block four, we now have that transaction that Sam sent to Alice. And so we're actually going to start sending ETH back to Sam and Alice. So Sam gets her, her, her 2.5 ETH, and Alice gets her 3.5 ETH. Now, funny thing, Plasma Contract has no ETH left. Lol, pwned. So we just took this Plasma Operator out. Now, this is something new, new for this overview. This is a reenactment that maybe will make a little bit more intuitive sense because there are more cats. So this is the plasma operator attacking the plasma chain, and this is your users. And the users are like, F this, I'm meowt, and they send exit transactions. So they go, da da da, exiting the plasma chain. Boom, pwned, easy. So <laughs> we, we just <laughs> took him out. Oh man, that's so much fun. <laughs> Exit failed, go plasma, right? So this is, this is the ex it's exciting because plasma allows us to scale up to with many transactions per second, but we still get the really strong security guarantees that are based on this crypto economic incentive game that is being played with Casper and proof of work that is securing the main net Ethereum. So we have the same kind of or very similar security guarantees, but we get this nice transactions per second boost. Now, there are other plasma chains, plasma cash. So <laughs> uh, Vitalik has just uh, uh, released or, or talked about it yesterday. Um, we, we, Vitalik and I came up with this just like a few days ago, and it's super exciting. And so Lil Wayne is checking out the plasma cash. Super, super fun. I love Lil Wayne. Um, anyway, so, so minimal client. So there, there are a couple nice things about plasma cash. There's, there are pros and cons for, for all of these plasma designs. Remember, the important part of this is it's a design family. It's a family of designs. Now, plasma cash, minimum client uh, 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 validation. So, clients are watching for misbehavior. In the previous plasma chain, the clients would have to download all of the blocks and ch validate all of the state transitions because you could, in uh, you, the the plasma operator could at any point create out of thin air a bunch of tokens that you know uh, increased its ba their the balance really really high and then just exited with everyone's coins. However, in Plasma Cash, the exciting thing is we give a serial number to individual tokens. Now, what does this actually do? This means that we, the, the, right before we had, we were submitting this, this root hash, and we're still submitting a, a root hash. This is just, we're technically two root hashes, but, but I won't go into the details. But the important thing is that now Alice and, uh, can just check for coins that are relevant to Alice, or, or Sam can check for coins that are relevant to Sam. And that means that if you hold, you know, 10 coins in your, in your wallet or something like this, then you're only ch verifying the branches of the, the Merkle tree that are related to you. So this Merkle tree can get really huge, right? You can scale up this middle, this plasma operator without actually uh, having to scale up the user's uh, uh, computers for verification as well. And so this is important because if we were to scale up the plasma operator without doing this kind of like sharded validation, then we would lose our security guarantees around being able to detect when some uh, m operator was malicious and exit the chain in time. So it's really about constraining the operator while still preserving security guarantees. So let's take a look at this, this Merkle tree. Now, I, I really want to give more talks explaining Merkle trees because they're so incredibly useful for designing all of these things because you can prove inclusion and you can prove exclusion. So you, you publish this one hash, right, and then you can prove that all of these things exist in that hash or that something else does not exist in this, in this tree, sorry, I should say. So the way that this kind of works is you have, you know, these two, these two addresses, they get hashed together. Well, before I say that, I forgot to mention that the IDs for each coin is based on, I at least in, in this kind of simple version, the IDs for each coin is based on just the index of the, the, of the, the, the token in the, the Merkle tree. So you basically have, you know, coin zero is owned by Sam and coin five is owned by Althea. And so, 
what we actually do is we have these hashes, and they secure, they make sure, they, they, you hash together the Sam's address and Alice's address, and you get, you know, whatever's up here. And then you can hash together these two, and you get what's up here. And so a hash is just, you know, you take some data, it produces a unique uh, output for, you know, one, uh, like a one-to-one -one mapping, essentially. And so you get, this, you get this nice property where because this and this can only equal this, and because this and this can only equal this, then on this and this can only equal that, and this and this can only equal that. So you can actually, just by saying, okay, do I want to see if Sam's address is in this chain, you can just verify, okay, does this and this hash together to that? Does this and this hash together to that? Does this and this hash together to that? Okay, it checks out. That's you know, included in the Merkle tree. And so, it, we, can, we can also say, okay, let's, you know, someone wanted to see if I, if I actually owned coin zero instead of Alice. Well, you can hash these two together and you basically immediately realize that doing this stuff gives you an alternate root hash. So just changing one element on these in the leafs allows you to see that it, it is, was not included. And so this is what we're actually submitting to the blockchain. And this is where we get our, like, uh, we, we get to compress a lot of information. Um, and so this is useful for all sorts of crypto-economic uh, protocols and, and plasma chains and just everything. It's, it's an amazing construction. So, great. Sam is going to, and this is, this is kind of shows you that you only care about your coins, right? Your, Sam has, uh, you know, if you receive a coin, you're going to check the Merkle tree and you're going to say, okay, is that coin valid on this Merkle tree? Am I allowed to be to to have it? And so you remember, you're only checking one part of the the tree. The tree. So you can actually, with this, start scaling up the plasma operator. So the plasma operator is even big. Now the plasma operator is really big. So not everyone can then create a new block because no one, no, not everyone can like you know pr verify all you know thousands and thousands of transactions that are going on. But everyone can verify their portion of the Merkle tree. And because you can verify your portion of the Merkle tree, we can scale up block proposal, aka who's able to you know, change the state without losing the security guarantees of if the change is incorrect, then users are able to leave or challenge it. So that's really important. And so this is, this is a really nice, nice thing. Another thing is we get to remove confirmations. So that means that before we were sending transactions and you know, Sam had to watch the main chain to see if it was included and send a confirmation to, to Alice. Well, now we don't actually have to do that. We can just send transactions to the main chain, it gets mined, and the uh, balances are immediately updated. So this is, this is really nice. It's just you know, a UX uh, uh, big gain. Um, so, and the last, last little thing is mass exit mitigation. Basically, because you have to exit coins, coin by coin, it means that you don't actually have the ability to, to kind of print a new coin, uh, uh, change the balance of your you know, plasma operator, and then sp send one exit to, to take all of the coins. Instead, you can just, uh, instead the plasma operator would have to send exits to many, many different coins, which means that users have a chance to kind of uh, battle it out and, and they, they can you know, challenge the, the, those exits. So it, it basically, it basically the, the kind of result of all this is that uh, users are not in a mad dash to get their coins out if there is an invalid state transition. So that's great. Cool. So there's not, I mean, th this is not like uh, a, a panacea. There's always trade-offs, but um, these are these we're working on kind of like addressing these trade-offs and you should work on addressing these trade-offs too because you should be designing your own plasma chains because um, because they're, they're a lot of fun um, and so so some I I issues are like the indivisibility of tokens is hard to get around so essentially you know if, if we're limited by uh, you know sending individual tokens maybe uh, if you you know it, the smaller the denomination the kind of less worth it is to to you know, print a new token on the main chain and, and bring it onto the plasma chain. Um, so, so this is something that we're addressing with, you know, potentially splitting the tokens into smaller pieces or, you know, uh, probabilistic payments. So essentially, that's, that's saying, okay, I'm going to pay you 50 cents by saying I'll give you a dollar every other time. This is not quite perfect, but, it, you know, it, it can work for, for some micropayments. So, um, and... Clearly, <laughs> there's still no state transition. So there's still like a lot of different areas in Plasma that we can 
uh, research and 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 work on and get better. Like like state transitions would be awesome if we can. You know, there's just many many designs that we haven't explored. And so please join the plasma. You know, watch the plasma call and 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 think about your own plasma chains and learn Merkle trees. So contribute. It's great. There's a lot of research. Fun. <laughs> so. Uh, this is like an important design pattern, right? The, the whole point of all this, this plasma stuff is that we're trying to scale blockchains while not losing the kind of decentralization that, that we get from blockchains. The reason why we're all here in the first place is this whole new design pattern, this new paradigm kind of like mind shift that's going on where we realize that computer programs are powerful and we want to make sure that the people who control that power or the systems that control that power are well balanced and not exploitable. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to constrain actors that are key participants that could potentially mess up the system. So essentially, why are we using deposits well it gives us large incentives to 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 punish validators so it constrains them and then if we have any problems with them we punish them so this is just like an example of like this is the the, the thought process that creates these you know new crypto economic protocols it's constraints and so uh, another thing is the, the, this is where trust is really established because by limiting the actual, the potential actions of actors, we are able to say, okay, I don't know who's you know, playing this game. I don't know who's participating. I don't like, know them personally. In other words, I haven't established some kind of social reputation or, or something with them, but I know that they are constrained in what they can do to me or I have some recourse if they ever do something wrong. And so because I know the rules of the game, I'm much more comfortable playing it. And so this is, this is critical. And so when you're designing these protocols, you need to impose costs for bad behavior. And that is kind of, this is, this is the, the crux. We are constraining central authority when we build these crypto economic protocols. So we want in Plasma to store minimal information on the main chain. We want to make sure that we don't actually compute every state transition directly on the main chain. That's where our security, that's our, where our speed benefits come in. And the, the Plasma, it basically allows you to not store so much intermediary state. In other words, if I send you transactions and you send me transactions and we go back and forth a bunch of times, the only time that the, that the main chain actually cares is when we exit. Right, we can still be transacting amongst ourselves, and then only when we exit does the main chain care. And so that's where we get our, our speed benefit. Um, and so this threat of recourse, even though we have what seems like a central operator, right? Seemed that plasma operator was a, a key actor that is kind of has special rights and that they were able to produce blocks. But even so, they were constrained in what they can do. And that allows us once again to trust the chain. Now you can actually break that up and you know, maybe make the central actor a proof of stake, you know, validators that are validating availability, which is part of some designs that we're thinking of now and that you should be thinking of as well, but it, is, it even works in the context of a completely centralized uh, like proof of authority uh, operator. So, exciting. So there's some other constructions. Once again, we, we you know, exchanges, arbitrary state transitions, um, you know, even more scaling techniques. Uh, we, this, is, this is really important. And something else that's important is the base level sharding for higher throughput. So we can ex process, process more transactions per second if we scale up the main chain. So that brings us to da, 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 sharding. So we, we gotta, gotta learn all of Ethereum in, in 35 minutes. So sharding phase zero and phase one. This is where we're kind of, uh, uh, where we are now for implementing sharding. And we have sharded clients, by the way, that are in the works. You should check out github.com slash Ethereum slash sharding. So these clients do not even require hard fork. But let's get into why, what, what sharding really is in the first place. So this is what we have right now. We have a bunch of computers that are running the blockchain and they're processing every single transaction, right? And so now, one way we could scale a blockchain, and so one way people are scaling a blockchain, is by just making it so that you process more transactions per second, right? And that just means that you have a beefier computer that's processing more transactions per second, right? Right now we process 15 transactions per second. That's only because we have a particular constraint on what kinds of computers we want to run Ethereum. Now, what we could do is we could say, okay, only beefier computers can run, run Ethereum now. And now we're processing 100 transactions per second, 150, whatever. But that means that the number of people who are actually able to verify the state transitions goes down. 
right? The whole point of, of us doing that plasma cache thing was so we could only, we could make it so that we scale up the blockchain without having to verify, you know, having, having the, the, the clients have beefy computers to verify. This is the same, same concept. And then, you know, we could scale it even larger and just have one big computer, quantum computer, that's doing all the blockchain for us. But the problem is this doesn't at all constrain the central authority. We, the, we're kind of beholden. We can't even verify whether or not things are going right. And so this is, this is like, okay, yes, you can, scale a, you can scale a blockchain, but can you scale a blockchain and maintain the whole reason why we're here, which is constraints on authority, decentralization, incentive alignment, all that stuff. So instead what we're doing is we are using sharding to essentially take all these little computers, put them together, and create one fancy big computer that is kind of the sum total of all of those computers running in the network. So, so we design a, a mechanism or a number of mechanisms which then when combined, when all these computers combine, create this one pretty fast machine. It's a little bit crazy to think about and it's hard to build, but Everyone can do it, and it's actually possible to, it's very possible to do, and we're, we're, we're already getting there. But, you know, we can always get help, so, so please, please do contribute. Um, sharding phase zero. So this is the kind of very first uh, uh, sharding uh, uh, move, and this is just actually all it does is, first, it doesn't require a hard fork. Instead, we just deploy a contract on the main chain, a validator manager contract, and that is essentially, val that, that takes some, some validators and, and you you put up some stake, and then you can validate the, the, the kind of sharded network. But the interesting thing is, you know, it has a set of validators, it has Ethereum shards, but it's only data availability. This is not like state transition. So we're basically only saying, okay, data is available. Now, if you'll, you actually, uh, as you design these protocols, you realize how hard data availability is. Like, knowing that data is going to be there is required for being able to prove that, you know, something went wrong. If you don't know what is actually going on, then you can't prove that something went wrong. So we're solving this one first. But then phase one, which should you know, shortly follow, we're actually going to be including you know, the Ethereum upgrades for you know, like eWASM and account abstraction and all the kind of fancy new um, uh, Ethereum tech that's in the works so that your, your new clients on these shards are going to be you know, super fast and super easy to program. Now, there are three main actors. There's kind of four, but three, I'll just call it three. Um, you have users you have block proposers, and you have validators. Now, the way that this works is the users are going to be sending transactions to the block proposers. The block proposers are going to be composing a bunch of transactions, bundling them together, and creating a block or a collation on a particular shard. These, these transactions, by the way, specify the shard ID. And then those blocks are going to be sent to the validators, or the collations. The, the collation is the name of a block on a shard. So the collations will be sent to the validators. And the validators, what they will do is they'll just say, OK, this collation exists. And so there's going to be an interesting relationship where users pay block proposers or col uh, collation proposers and co uh, block proposers pay validators. And so essentially what, what, what is cool about this is you can actually have it so that uh, the, the block proposers have, they are on a particular shard, keeping track of this shard, and they can, they can have interesting rules for how they collect transactions. Maybe they are uh, uh, a block proposer for a particular dApp, and that dApp says, okay, we want all of our transactions to be included you know, first, and we want every single one of them because you know, we want our users to have a good experience. That means that they can create, they can collect a bunch of transactions, filter them by only their dApp, propose the, the you know, whole bunch of transactions to the validators and pay the validators enough that they are included uh, in, the, in the main chain. So this is actually really natural. Once you start thinking in this way, like when you separate data availability from state transitions, it really gets a lot easier to think about these protocols. So what are some, some terms, terminology? We've got validators who are randomly sampled to create collations. So remember, these are like you know, the blocks on the shards. And the reason why we're randomly sampling them is we don't want validators to be able to particularly target one shard, because that would mean that if, a, if you were able to target one shard, then you could like 51% attack one piece of the network. But instead, what we want to do is we want to randomly sample from these validators so that you would, to, to attack the network, you'd have to have a like, majority stake in all of the validators. And 
we're going to create these, these collations, and then the validators are going to check that they exist and submit the headers to the main chain. And so this is just like what a, what a header looks like, but I don't think we have time to go into. Um, so now, the other thing is there are these periods. Periods are yet another term, I'm sorry. Um, it's basically five blocks right now, it, you know, it can change. The idea is that it's the number of blocks it takes for every shard to have inputted a collation header into the, the main chain. So once per period, every shard should, you know, be able to update. And so what this means is uh, you, 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 the validators are able to, we have this, this thing called look-ahead periods. And look-ahead periods say, okay, what am I going to be validating in the future, you know, four periods ahead? And so that gives you, like, you know, 20 blocks to say, okay, I'm going to need to validate this shard, so let me download, you know, block proposals and, and uh, things relevant to that particular shard as a validator so I can then contribute to it. So this is, this is how we get the, the you know, give, uh, give our validators enough time to get ready to produce a new block. Great. So they, the validators are just verifying block availability, once again. Super, super cool stuff. So here's a little example of, of what this really means. So each period, right, these circles are periods, the, the, the squares are, are blocks. Each period is five blocks. And what we're going to do is we're going to do this, this nice little thing where, where we first look ahead, then clients are going to submit some transactions, then the block proposers are going to create a collation, then we're going to you know, have the validators download and uh, uh, submit the block or the, the collation, and then we're, we'll have a little bit of an attack and we'll mitigate it. So, so this, sh this should be exciting. The last two are some little, you know, this is an attack and this is a mitigation. So first, the, the look-ahead period. So here we have the four look-ahead periods. These haven't happened yet. We're currently on this shard, but we're going to be able to see the validators will be able to compute which shard they're going to be validating. So you know this guy's validating shard one, this guy's validating shard two, et cetera. And so you see, we're just like randomly sampling from these validator sets. And so no validator is going to have too much power over one shard. That's where this kind of like decentralization, uh, uh, this security guarantee around uh, um, particular shards having the same security as the full validator set. So boom, we, we've got this look ahead period. Now what we're going to do is the client is going to submit some transactions. Great. So the, the, they, they submit, <laughs> whoops, that was really fast. They just submit a transaction to the transaction pool tells what shard you want to you wanna talk to. And so the block proposers are going to come in and pull from the transaction pool and create a collation. Now, the validators, they're going to take these, these, uh, these collation proposals and they're going to just submit some to the main chain. So they pulled it into the, they, they pulled them in and now they're verif, oh, whoopsies. <laughs> so first, before they, they know what to build on, excuse me, um, they're going to verify that the data is available because they, there's in this, the validator manager contract, they only, only want to build on available uh, blocks because that's the only blocks that they get rewards on. So they're just going to go one, two, three, they verify as far back as they would like, and then they choose ahead and they build on top of it. So submit some collation headers to the main chain, and boom, now we have updated all of our shards at the same time. So you can kind of think that each one of these validators is running a pretty simple you know, protocol. It's going to be running on a laptop. Each one of these um, block proposers or, or collation proposers are, are running on a laptop. Users are running on a laptop. But still, we're able to shard, and we're able to get you know, many, many more uh, transactions per second because not everyone is validating everything. So now we're going to say, uh, the evil validator is going to come in and submit a, a, a invalid block. And so we'll see how that works. Basically, uh, we follow the same format that we did before, you know, downloading some block proposals and, and submitting to the main chain. The evil validator is going to propose and create an invalid block, so no one's able to download this thing. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to say, okay, I am a new validator. I am not evil. I'm this guy. I'm going to instead build on a... I'm going to check the history and I'm going to say, okay, that's unavailable. I wasn't able to download it. This is available and I'm going to keep going back. That's available as well. I'm going to choose this as my head instead of the, the one that I couldn't download and build on that one. So now we have this way for validators to, you know, just circumvent a unavailable block. And this is all managed in the validator manager smart contract. So super exciting. We're able to get this kind of scaling, able to prove availability, and, 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 and mitigate these, these kinds of attacks uh, if, they, if they ever do come up. Um, cool, so attack failed, go sharding. So 
amazing. We now have this Casper plasma sharding. I, well, I, I wish I went over Casper, but you know, there are a lot of videos online. Um, but we have all these things. Casper giving the security of the main chain, you know, making sure that, that validators that misbehave are going to be penalized. And Plasma, a, a design principle that allows developers, even on the current Ethereum, without any you know, sharding, to, to get a lot of transactions per second through like really you know, good, well-designed protocols. And then sharding, where the core chain is going to be able to be moving you know, much faster. And, and this is actually you know, sooner rather than later. Once again, shout out to uh, github.com slash ethereum slash uh, sharding. So with Casper sharding and plasma, we can scale to the moon. Um, <laughs> this is like, this, this is, you know, just, just like, just to, I don't know, give an idea of like where this, the, the validators, we have this one set of validators and they're super duper constrained. They're super, you know, secure. We, we know, we trust them because we have this economic proof that says, okay, if the validators misbehave, they'll, they'll get punished and, and there, there's these consequences for, for doing things that we don't want. And then we're going to also have the, the ability for the validators to have that security split up onto multiple different shards so that we can get transactions per second, high throughput, and each one one of these can be run on a laptop so we don't lose that decentralization verification uh, uh, stuff. And then we have the ability for each one of these shards to contain tons and tons of applications, you know, and many of these may be plasma applications. Um, this is kind of exciting stuff. Uh, as long as you design your, your, your uh, um, application well, you can probably fit it on, uh, you know, it, it, I mean, if you have a perfect design, you could even fit it on today's uh, blockchain. But, la but later on, it'll be easy to, to, to get you know, really, really high, s high throughput. So this is something that, I came, that, 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 that came up during dinner yesterday. Shout out to all the people at dinner. Um, where it was like web 1.0, we have these like static web pages. And everyone's serving static web pages to each other. So everyone, it's kind of like decentralized in a way. And then we have Web 2.0, where we have this like social media and and these big these big uh, you know tech giants that pop up. And now we're submitting comments and posting things, and we're giving our data to these these central authorities. But now with Web 3.0, what we're doing is we're realizing that giving all of our information and get, you know having having so much control over where we we are going, excuse me, where we are going is is actually dangerous. And so we need to be able to design our our applications so that they actually constrain central authorities built in, baked into the protocol itself. And so that's kind of like what we're doing. And that's why it's so important that we make sure that our you know, plasma chains have the same security as the, the root chain or that you know, the validators, everyone is able to validate a chain um, no matter your, your hardware requirements, except for you, know, like you just need a laptop, et cetera. So this is exciting and we need to, you know, let's, let's, let's do it. So part of this, is that we all need to do it together. So, so just like everyone needs to be able to validate a main chain, everyone needs to be able to participate in the creation of this new internet. And the, my personal idea for the best way for this to actually happen is if we have, not, whenever I design a crypto economic protocol, I'm like, okay, we need a lot of stakeholders with different interests so they all balance each other out. But just like that, we need to protocol design our protocol designing. And so that means that people who are like writing these protocols, like myself and you know, many people in the audience, they need to be from a diverse set of backgrounds. They need to be a diverse stakeholder group from different communities. And so it is, it is vital for us to actually to like achieve this decentralization of power for us to also welcome in you know, new ideas, new people from different communities. So if you are you know, a newcomer to the space, it is so critical, like you are, like what is going to save this, this stuff? Because I know that if it's just, you know, if it's just us basically, if, the, if it's just a small, you know, small group of people from a very particular background, we're not going to build a future that is equitable and, and really decentralized, it's just going to be you know, the same old, same old. So let's, you know, continue this like open software, free software movement. Let's, you know, welcome each other. Let's be nice to each other. Spread the love. You know, this is some knowledge sharing right here. Good stuff. Fun, happy, good feels. Good feels for all. So ETH research. <laughs> Good feels. <laughs> um, this is this is you know a lot of really cool stuff is going on. So definitely read this. This is where we like post a lot of research ideas and you know take a look. And it's this is we're trying to we want to be as inclusive as possible and and open as possible. So this is this is where we actually talk about our ideas. Um, so that's a Doge. 
<laughs> Sorry, I really liked that. That was fun. This little <laughs> quiet. Anyway, so that, that's, that's basically it. Thank you. <laughs> Right in the middle, dead center. Thank you for your presentation. I had a question about the plasma aspect uh, and the second attack you discussed, the one with the funny cat at the end, about the um, uh, plasma chain uh, authority uh, trying to do an exit. And if I remember correctly, what you said is that this is prevented by the fact that the user can do an exit and it's executed in the reverse order, so they exit first. Yeah. So my question is, what happens if the operators create a new identity, let's call it Dave, with a lot of money, that exits after Alice and Sam? And so is there an assumption that the last exit will be a legitimate one? Because I think attackers can always spam exits later. Fantastic question. So that is exactly right. So the idea is users are going to be watching the chain to make sure that it is a valid chain that they're building on. If a user is to submit a transaction on an invalid chain, then all of these guarantees kind of go out the window because we are saying, okay, the user is able to make sure that they're not building on a valid chain, and so why would they build on a valid chain? They're just going to exit if they if they see it's an invalid chain, and that means that their transaction will be ordered, you know, in in order. So essentially. Everything is going well, users are submitting transactions. A bad attack happens, and then all the users s stop sending new transactions. They say, oh, actually, now I, I really should not be building on this chain because the guy would, if I did build on that chain, if I did submit a, a transaction, then they would be able to exit before me. And so that is, that is, a, uh, that is absolutely correct. And this, this kind of, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, and, and anyway. I, I wish I wish I is there, are there more is that it huh we're out of time well thank you so much everyone talk after <laughs>Today I'm going to talk about three-dimensional blockchain scaling with Cosmos and Tenement. Um, it touches on some parts that Carl talked about earlier, um, but it also introduces some new and maybe slightly different concepts on like possible solutions to scalability within blockchains. Um, oh, and yeah, I'm also very sorry for like the clickbaity title. Uh, we thought of it uh, last week, and to us it sounded very funny, um, and I still stand by it. It's like it kind of describes what I'm going to talk about, because I'm going to talk about three different things we can do to scalability. Oh yeah, so I'm Adrian, and I'm also working on the Cosmos project. Um, so yeah. Um, right, so today I'm going to talk about three-dimensional blockchain scaling. And you can already see the three dimensions here. Um, so I'm going to talk about consensus scaling, state machine scaling, and interchain scaling. And like, just as a brief recap of what a blockchain really is, uh, like when you look at Ethereum or Bitcoin, for example, um, a blockchain is n like not this monolithic stack. We implement it as a very monolithic s stack up until now. But really, a blockchain is that you have peer-to-peer -peer consensus uh, or peer-to-peer -peer networking at the base layer. Then you have a consensus layer on top, and then you have a state machine layer on top of that. So that's really what a theorem, like what a blockchain is. So in the case of Ethereum, you have lib P2P um, as the networking stack, you have proof of work as a consensus layer, and finally you have the EVM as a state machine on top of all of this. And so users, it's like, if you're a developer, you can you either have the choice of building your own state machines or building on top of existing state machines. And then interchain scaling is all about how do we have multiple heterogeneous blockchains and how do they interoperate. Uh, and lastly, I'll talk a little bit about the modes of security that blockchains can operate in. Um, but uh, so like the main thing I want to convey today is like I'm not telling you exactly how to scale. Like I'm just like explaining a bunch of options that developers have uh, in order to scale their decentralized applications. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So these are my three main goals for the talk, and like. 
I know it's early in the morning, some people might have not had their second coffee by now. So it's like, if you only take something away, like only take away these three points. It's like, the different approaches to scalability. We can either scale at consensus, um, at the state machine level, or at the interchain level. Where, and I'll go into much more detail on all of them. Um, and for the security modes, you can either choose the sovereign model, so something akin to Ethereum or Bitcoin, where it's a completely independent chain, a hosted model, where you share the security with some other chains, so you share a common validator set, but you still have heterogeneous blockchains, and a plasma chain. Um, oh yeah, and lastly, and I think like, if you are currently writing decentralized applications, it's like, I would recommend that you don't just like sit around and hope that someone else solves your scalability problems. It's like, you as a developer, it's really your responsibility to go out there and see what are the potential scaling solutions that I can use right now to build my applications. It's like, don't just hope that someone solves scaling eventually. Actively look for solutions that you can use today to scale your applications. So I will briefly, uh, yes. Um, so I'll start with the consensus scaling. Mm. So Nakamoto consensus, um, like traditional proof of work, chain-based consensus, where the longest chain is the correct chain. The reason why we need to have quite large block times is because we need to have the safety margin, um, where the propagation, so like generally speaking, the way blockchain works is that uh, you start with a block, you validate that block, and then you kind of try to create a new block on top of this. And then once you have created a new block on top of this, you need to propagate it to everyone else in the network so that all the other participants know about that block. The reason why we have to have quite large block times in Nakamoto consensus is that in order to um, be safe, uh, we have to give this leeway that we might have very long network latencies. Um, because if there's very long network latencies and they overtake the block time, we come into the scenario where we start having a split brain scenario. So that's a fork, right? It's like if it takes you longer to propagate a block to the network than it takes you to uh, produce a new block, the network will, have start, will start have diverging opinions on the block. Um, and realistically speaking, diverging opinions, um, like forks within the blockchain are a terrible user experience. It's like the, like no user expects to press a button and then to find out 30 minutes later that this got reverted. Like this is not how anyone thinks about how the internet works or how any sort of application works. Um, so like this ability to never go split brain is really important. Um, and so this has been tradi the traditional consensus layer, so Nakamoto consensus. Um, BFT consensus, Byzantine Fault Tolerant consensus, it's a quite old research area, but it hasn't been applied to blockchains much as of late. The nice thing about it is that we're always safe, um, so we no never go split brain. Uh, due to that, we can push block times massively lower. Um, they can just be optimally larger than network propagation takes. And even if the network latency becomes higher, um, instead of producing forks, we just start slowing down the network. So network latencies increase across the network. We just become slower producing blocks, so our block times just increase. Um, but in the normal case, this allows us to drastically reduce block times. Um, so Bitcoin is at 10 minutes to give you the safety margin, um, that you're not splitting too much, and that the current miner doesn't have too much of an advantage over everyone else. Um, and Ethereum is at like 15 seconds. I went there time. Seems reasonable. All right. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about tenement consensus. And tenement consensus is a BFT algorithm. Um, it, it's like from 2014, we've been developing it since then. And it has a bunch of nice properties. So it has instant finality. As soon as you send a transaction and it's included in a block, this transaction is considered, is completely final. There will not be a fork at which point uh, the user will be presented a different state of the network than he saw when he saw the transaction for the first time. So complete finality within one block. The other nice thing is that you have extremely efficient light clients. 
Um, so in traditional Nakamoto consensus, you kind of have to keep up with um, with the headers to verify you that you're on the longest chain. In BFT consensus and tenement consensus, you have to be able to update um, your validator set, so the, the people validating the network. Um, and you have to be able to update them like once every three weeks, kind of depending on your security assumption around unbonding and proof of stake. Um, moreover, it's safe in an asynchronous network, so uh, we, never, we never become unsafe. So it, does, it um, prioritizes safety over liveness. And we have liveness in a partially synchronous network. So if you have the assumption that eventually we will have these messages will get delivered, uh, we will always make progress. The incredible thing is that with this as a consensus scaling solution, we can have block times of one second. Um, so we can have, let's say, 100 validators around the world. And I'll come later back to like how these validators get selected. But it's not as bad as it sounds. It's like not these hundred authorities, but rather these people are elected um, through economic stake. And so like everyone in the room that has a, par a tiny amount of this economic stake is able to vote on who these, val like is able to delegate the economic stake to someone else. Oops. Is able to delegate the economic stakes to someone else and participate in the, consen uh, like participate in the consensus. Um, at the same time, this gives you like at the peak, if you have 64 validators and like beefy data centers, this gives you about 4,000 transactions per second. So like think about the scalability increase um, that, you get, that you get from switching to BFT consensus. Like one of the downsides is you have quite high network overhead. Um, and like some future improvements we're working on, it's like BLS signatures, um, so we can aggregate votes on the network, on the network stack, or the P2P network layer, um, so that we reduce this network overhead optimistic pipelining to get even higher transaction throughput and DKG constructions, decentralized key generation, um, which would allow us to like, prevent validator front running. Um, and maybe the last part is like, this is available right now. So um, we have an implementation called Tenement Core, and if you want to build your own blockchain on top of this consensus, you literally only have to write the state machine. Um, and even that like is much easier with the tooling we've developed. Um, so like instead of having to worry like or fork some other code base, the only thing you do is you take Tenement Core and you say, this is the exact application logic I want to build, and then build it on top of it. And you get all the and you get the consensus in the network for free. Is there anything else? I am. But of course, in usually um, so w w if you're using tenement consensus, actually the limiting factor isn't the consensus anymore. The limiting factor is the state machine, right? So like the EVM or some other, the UTXO set that you've built on top of the consensus. Um, and like what we can get in terms of state machine scalability, like you can simply look at parity versus geth. So parity is about two and a half times faster. So like there's a lot of room for optimization within state machines. And I'm also going to make another bold claim. I don't think most people should build like super specialized application directly on the EVM. The EVM was designed for smart contracts, not for smart, like it's a, it's a great use case if you need to deploy low transaction volume, one-off things, like actual con contracts. If you want to build a DEX or something like that, you're most likely much better off building it into a specialized state machine um, because you have all the optimization like, you can do whatever you want to the state machine. Um, so you can design a complete protocol, and you have complete freedom in how you build this. You're not constrained by some block ass limit um, or the gas cost. Um, so like, and I think for most applications, there's a real downside with, uh, like, the EVM is great if you need user-level scripting. So if you need user-level Turing completeness, like, imagine, if you are building an application that requires the user to deploy their own smart contracts to interact with that application, the EVM is amazing. But if the only thing your user does is like send a transaction, um, there's no reason why you need to carry all this extra cool stuff with you to like, just build this one specific application. And like, 
And removing all this cool stuff around you like re reduces the attack surface massively that you have to face. And like, it's much easier to reason exactly about what your state machine does. And at the same time, it's more scalable because you don't have to um, run all this extra code. Um, so yeah, in conclusion, the EVM is amazing if you want to deploy contracts. If you want to build DEXs, I don't think it's your best bet. So, but even the EVM, like we can scale the EVM quite a lot. So we've built something called Ethermint, which is essentially an EVM put on top of Tenement Consensus. So right, we have now these 4,000 transactions per second um, that we can have on the consensus level, and now we have the state machine as the EVM. And it's fully Web3 compatible, so like all the existing tooling works, it's already fully proof of stake. Um, so it's like, it's something that you can try it today. The cool thing that once you put the EVM on like a BFT consensus algorithm is that it gives you, first of all, much higher transaction throughput, and secondly, extremely efficient light clients. So if you want to build a phone app that, is secu that securely interacts with, uh, with Ethermint, for example, uh, you have to come online once in like every three weeks. So you have to do like one header update once every three weeks, that's it. You don't have to constantly keep up with all the headers, uh, which for mobile devices is massive. So due to the fact that Ethermint support, like Tenement Consensus supports about one, blocking, um, one second block times, this is roughly 15 times as fast as current Ethereum, and so at the same gas lim block gas limit, we have about 15x of throughput. And like there's nothing, so like this is a different kind of assumption that, um, like if you remember Vlad's triangle from yesterday, that was all about um, how you can have fewer nodes, a lot of nodes, and so the argument with Tenement Consensus is that you can have fewer nodes so in the hundreds, but these nodes, nodes are fairly selected through economic majority votes, essentially, or delegation, um, by the entire stakeholder system in the chain. Um, yeah, so that's Ethermint. That's a like quick introduction. It's like, essentially, if you need fast, uh, like fast smart contracts, this is a good bet. But I was talking about how we should make it easier to, for people to build their own state machines. And this is really what the Cosmos SDK is. The Cosmos SDK, you can imagine it's sort of like NPM, but for blockchains. So it allows you, it's a bunch of mod, but by the way, it's not that nice yet. It's like NPM is pretty awesome. It will take us a while to get there. Um, but you can imagine it as being able to pull different modules that you need. So for example, if you want to build a proof of stake system, you pull in the staking module. If you want to build a governance, like if you need governance, you pull in the governance module. If you need some way to, like, to do signature check checking, so authentication, you pull in the auth module. And if you need the EVM, you pull in the EVM module. So like, it really gives you this ability in very few lines of code, code to build your own state machine. Previously, this was extremely hard, right? Like, most projects that are currently active essentially ended up forking the Bitcoin C++ code base and just like, yeah, we'll just modify it a little bit. Like, we modify the state machine a little bit to do exactly what we want, but they still had to fork the entire code base and now have to live with, like, it's not a nice development experience. It wasn't something that everyone could do. With the Cosmos SDK, you can literally build Bitcoin, proof of stake, and mostly like 200 lines of code. Of course, the SDK isn't done yet. It's like we've written it this in Go, and in the future, we're hoping to um, add multiple languages to it and also like, add different VMs as modules so that instead of having, like, that you just have the choice. Like, there can be an EVM module, there can be a WASM module, different VMs can all, like, you can decide which ones you want to pick. Um, of course, state machine scaling doesn't give you full vertical scale. Like, it only gets you so far, right? Because we're still talking about scaling one blockchain. So, and I personally don't see a future in which we will have one homogeneous blockchain that runs everything. Most likely what will happen is that we'll have application-specific blockchains where, for example, um, like we had this example of Visa. I don't think Visa will build their payment processors within the EVM. I think they want something dedicated that they fully understand, that they fully built. 
no matter whether the open source didn't have a decentralized validator set running it, but in my mind, we, are moving, we will end up moving towards a world of heterogeneous blockchains. Um, oh, and also like things like state channels totally work with both either of these concepts. So because state channels are amazing, so uh, it's like this doesn't limit you. So now I want to talk a little bit about interchain scaling. Um, and interchain scaling is really, we have a future of heterogeneous blockchains. How do we make sure that these blockchains actually are able to talk to each other? Um, and again, like this is most likely we won't have a homogeneous future. Like different developers and different projects will want different trade-offs and they don't want to be restricted to the same platform. It's like, yeah. Um, so what IBC allows you to do is to do secure transfers between different blockchains. Um, IBC relies on this notion of finality that um, like we don't get reorgs or like that, that IBC relies on the fact that your blockchain needs to have uh, deterministic finality. So you, we can't have this Nakamoto consensus finality where we say it's probabilistic and like eventually nothing will get reverted anymore. We actually need true finality. And then the way it works is that both these chains are light clients to each other. So let's say you have chain A and chain B and both of them are tracking each other's validator set so that they can receive messages signed by the other chain and verify the authenticity. Um, and like again, this sounds crazy, right? Because uh, light clients generally still require ma like a, a large amount of headers. But again, like if you have fi like within proof of stake and with finality, you can probably get away with like doing a validator set update every three weeks, roughly, like every unbonding period in proof of stake. Um, and so then the way it works is essentially on blockchain A, you lock some tokens to the consensus of blockchain B construct a Merkle proof over that fact, and then send that Merkle proof, or some relay process can send, like anyone in the world can send that relay, that packet to blockchain B, and blockchain B knows about the validator set of blockchain A, so they can verify the authenticity of that message. And now they're 100% certain that there are some tokens locked on blockchain A that blockchain B controls. So they can now gener like give these tokens to other users. So currently, this supports uh, tokens. We're hoping to extend this, or we're extending this to NFTs later this year. And the ideal world, once we get there, is that it supports complex objects so that we can take, um, for example, blockchain A can issue a loan, and we can move the entire loan with its complex internal stake over to blockchain B, and then interest payments can happen on blockchain B. And now, so, but of course, we don't live in a world yet where every blockchain has finality. Um, so like Bitcoin and also Ethereum and like all proof of work chains essentially have this probabilistic finality. Um, and this is where Peggy comes in. Peggy is an adapter that essentially enforces finality over probabilistic chains. So it says that, let's say Peggy supports, so it listens to the blockchain and finalizes those block like after 100 blocks after you didn't get a revert it's essentially the validator set says okay now I trust that this block is finalized and this allows us to bridge proof of work chains into this finality IBC ecosystem where we can um, for example we can send tokens between Ethereum and Bitcoin um, given that we have two adapters for each of those chains um, because and like the reason why, like the scariest thing here is that we have to enforce this 100 block threshold. And a lot of the questions are like, what happens if there's a reorg after 100 blocks? Um, in my mind, this is not a huge issue anymore because I thought about it some more and like, if we actually have a 100 block deep hard fork uh, reorg within Ethereum, we will most likely have two Ethereums. Like, most exchanges use the confirmation between like six and 12 blocks. 
by the time 100 blocks have passed, they've moved millions of dollars. And there will be massive major economic incentives to like maintain two forks. Uh, so like, that's like, even though it sounds scary, it's like in reality, this will probably be fine. Um, but given this scenario of a lot of heterogeneous chains, one of the problem become, like one of the niceties of having like one chain is that you have a lot of liquidity within that chain because everything is within that ecosystem. So once we start having this world of heterogeneous chains, we need some way to provide liquidity to people. And this is really what the Cosmos Hub is about. It's like, it's a liquidity for provider for connected blockchains so that they can all tap into the same liquidity pool. Um, at the same time, it's sort of, it, it's a double spend protection mechanism um, between blockchains. So Ethereum has this cool property that users can't double spend each other, right? It's like, I can't send my coins to like two people and none of, like, those two transactions won't end up in the same chain. So I can't generate money out of thin air. The hub has exactly the same um, job, but between blockchains. So the hub maintains that two blockchains can't double spend each other. Uh, yep. And so now we're moving into modes of security. Um, Modes of security is really, you as an application developer, you can like choose what kind of security model fits you best. It's like, this is not about describing which one you should pick. It's like, these are the different options that you have. And depending on your use case, one might mo make more sense than another. So the first one is sovereign, right? So sovereign is like the basic default. It's probably the hardest, but it also gives you the most control. It allows you to change uh, it allows the um, stakeholders within that chain to change everything they want about how that chain operates. So this is kind of like the Ethereum Foundation running the EIP process and upgrading Ethereum at the, like, doing the hard forks for Ethereum. It gives you the ultimate control over you as a developer. So for example, if you want to build a true DEX, and by the way, I'm just using DEX as an example because I think DEXs are pretty cool and they will be very big in two, like, no, I can't say that. Um, they will, <laughs> no recommendations here, guys. Um, so, but given that, like, you want to build a DEX, right? So you have this, you have, maybe I have some staking, like, you need to come up with some staking token that defines who the stakeholders are within your system. Um, and then these stakeholders get to vote on every single aspect of th that DEX, whereas, and like, this is the major difference to the hosted model. As in the hosted model, you kind of assume, like maybe a good comparison is like, you own your own servers, um, or you're running on like virtualized instances in an Amazon data center. Like hosted is more like that, where you have to trust that the, um, oper that the stakeholders of, uh, that the validators, the, yeah, the, the economic stakeholders, the people running um, your underlying security mechanism are doing the right thing and are doing protocol upgrades that aren't breaking to you. Um, and maybe your use case might be too niche, actually. So it doesn't fit with them. And then eventually, yeah, so I'm a big fan of the sovereign model. But like hosted is like the nice thing, you share the security. Like you can share underlying security assumptions with the other validator set. And lastly, Plasma. Um, and so within Plasma, right, Carl talked about a bunch, like, you all have the same security, like in every single child chain, you have the same security assumption um, than in the root chain, which is great. Um, and I honestly, like most, a lot of things should possibly be plasma once we have generalized, uh, like general state transitions for plasma. Because like building things within a UTXO model is very hard, but once we have general state transition, like general fraud proofs of arbitrary state, we can like, use Plasma a lot. Um, yeah. Oh, actually, but like, the, actually, no, that's fine. Um, so this is actually like getting very close towards the end of my talk. I just wanna quickly recap uh, the goals I talked about earlier. So like understanding the, like, understanding the different approaches to scaling. So. We can either scale consensus, and that already gives you a massive improvement. 
Um, and like one of the nice things is it's out there right now, there's an implementation of tenement consensus within tenement core and within the parity client. Um, so like if you're thinking about building a major application, you should really think about building it directly on top of a very scalable and very safe consensus algorithm. Um, oh yeah, and one of those things I actually forgot to mention, I think, it's like tenement prioritizes safety over liveness. So like, we'll, like it never forks, it just halts until you can figure out why you would have forked. Um, which, like, in my mind, for most financial applications, this is probably the preferred mode of operation. That instead of, oh, we have some sort of network, like we have some sort of network level attacker, and now we just start forking when we have two competing histories, and like we'll throw one away. Um, it seems to me much safer to like, figure out what's going on and then resolve that problem, and then your life again. Um, the second thing is state machine scaling. It's like it's getting much easier right now to build customized blockchains. It's not as hard as it used to be. Like, that's the main thing. Like, building your own application-specific blockchain is getting massively easier right now. And it will continue to do so over like, the course of the coming years. So um, if you're some sort of like, heavyweight application, it makes a lot of sense to start looking into building your own application-specific blockchain and then picking a security model that's right for that. And the last part is, even in a world of heterogeneous blockchains where everyone starts building their own chains, we still have the possibility to communicate between those. And we still have the com possibility to access a lot of liquidity. Um, yeah. So again, know the available modes of security, so sovereign, hosted, or plasma. And like, I really want to drive this point home. It's like. Scaling is everyone's responsibility. There is like, if you're writing a Solidity smart contract and you're just hoping it scales, like, I don't think you're doing your users or your project a service. Like, really think about what is my application and how can I scale this to potentially millions of users. So like, you should be actively looking for design patterns that allow you to build scalable dApps, uh, decentralized applications. Yeah, scaling is everyone's responsibility. Don't wait for someone else to solve it for you. Um, and then that's it. Thank you very much. Dating transactions has become a unsurmountable burden for the little guy simply because if you want to become an Ethereum validator, like your hard drive can't write as fast as the state grows. So 